Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Western Baptist Church, and uh, I'm thankful for those of you who are courageous enough to bear the weather conditions and come here, and we'll hopefully, uh, we'll just hope that the destroyer doesn't come and take our firstborn. Um, as I look out there, it's, uh, it almost looks biblical out there. Um, let me go ahead and open us up in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, and we just pray for this night. We pray that you keep everyone safe in these conditions out there, the dust storm and whatever else may be coming. And Father, we do pray for this time that we have in your word in the book of Mark. We're thankful for our brother Terry and the preparation that he has put into uh, this lesson. Open up our hearts and our minds by the power of your spirit. Help us to absorb your teaching. And may you be glorified as you continue to grow us in, in accordance to your word. Uh, help us to grow in our understanding of your word and your will and your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we give thanks to you and pray these things in his name, Christ Jesus. Amen. Okay, well, we are well into chapter 8 of the book of Mark. We're still in this section where he is expanding his ministry, in this, in this case beyond Galilee. We've seen him do that in chapter 7, and uh, he's continuing that in chapter 8. So after he feeds the 4,000, which we saw last week, that ends in verse, verse uh, 10. Uh, he moves to Magdala. We have the map there. They were in Decapolis down there to the lower right, where they, he, he healed the deaf and dumb man, and he, he, he fed the 4,000. And then they went back up to Magdala, which is also called Dalmanutha. The people back then didn't make it easy for us. <laughs> they kept using different names for the same places, and they don't tell you which names go with which place. So we'll straighten that out, okay? In fact, uh, something that caused a bit of confusion earlier in this study, we'll straighten it all out tonight. It's all because of these double names. Plus so, multiple cities with the same name. What's that? Plus multiple cities with the same name. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the thing is, the people who wrote these accounts didn't bother explaining that because the people then would have understood it. <laughs> they didn't need to explain it. They're not thinking, now, we better clarify this for those people 2,000 years from now who aren't going to understand what we're talking about. Anyway, we'll, we'll straighten it out. So Dalmanutha is one name for this city, and Magdala is the other, and it's there on the west coast of the Sea of Galilee. But he doesn't stay there long. He gets up there, and the Pharisees ask for a sign, verses 11 to 13. Uh, we'll read through it and then go back and look at some details so verse 11 says, And the Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, Why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. And leaving them, he again embarked and went to the other side. So he didn't stay there long. Uh, he's going to be heading up north, northeast from here, and you kind of wonder, why did he bother <laughs> going over there if he's just going to turn around and leave? Well, he may have been there longer. We, you know, Mark doesn't include every little detail, so we don't know how long he was there. 
but it seems as though he's there and just telling the Pharisees, I'm not going to give you a sign, and then he leaves. <clears throat> These Pharisees were the same ones, probably, who were there earlier when he landed just north of Magdala in Gennesaret and healed all those people. This is back at the end of chapter 6, verses 53 to 56. Because in chapter 7, verse 1, the Pharisees who saw all that uh, start complaining that the disciples aren't following their little ceremonies. So they were aware of all of these healings, and yet they're still asking for a sign. What more sign do you want? <laughs> than, okay, so Jesus is kind of fed up with them. I, it says here that the Pharisees began to argue. Uh, it's the word that means to discuss. It's, it really literally means to seek together. So it has the idea of examining th something together. And from that, you get the idea of disputing or arguing as well as discussing. And the same word is uh, in the same verse when it says seeking from him a sign. That word seek is the root word for that word to discuss. The word to discuss has a prefix. This one doesn't. So they're looking for a sign, and that word sign means a, a, uh, a sign or a mark or a token, and usually it it's, has to do with a miracle and a testing sign, something that verifies the message. Um, when the apostles were out preaching Paul and, and Peter and all the rest, wherever they went preaching, they were, all, they were doing miracles healing people and casting out demons as evidence that the message they were giving was from God. So when he says a sign, he means one of these attesting miracles. Do something that will show us that what you're talking about really is from God. And I think their main concern here, and I'm just putting two and two together based on what they said back in chapter 7, the first Part of that when, you know, why aren't your disciples following our, our rules? And Jesus said, well, your rules don't count. <laughs> they're, they're off the, you know, they're off the wall. You set aside God's law in favor of your own fake rules. I think they were asking him here uh, for some evidence that he had the right to say that to them. I mean, they are the authority. They're the Pharisees. They're the ones in charge. And how dare you tell us our rules don't matter? Give us a sign that says you have the authority to tell us this. closes up. I don't know what it is. Anyway, <clears throat> they ask for a sign, and uh, it reminded me of something he said, or that Paul said elsewhere. First Corinthians chapter 1, we won't turn there, but He's dealing with wisdom in the first four chapters of 1 Corinthians. Earthly wisdom and godly wisdom. And he makes a, a point there. Uh, and I have this little chart. I don't have a handout for this. Trust me, it's up there. <laughs> um, he says there in 1 Corinthians that Jews ask for a sign and Greeks ask for wisdom. And he's kind of disgusted with both of them. Okay. So I put together this chart based on 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 22 to 25, just to analyze this, to give us some context for, for what he's dealing with here. So across the top of the chart... You can see those categories. You have the first column there is anti the, the antagonistic group. There are two of them. And then what they want, and then their reaction to the gospel, 
then the reality of the gospel and the nature of the gospel and then uh, what, how, what they want. How am I going to say this? This is an awkward sentence. How what they want relates to something else or what it relates to. Okay. So we have the two groups there, Jews and Gentiles. Okay, and the Jews seek for a sign. And what is their reaction to the gospel? Well, it's a stumbling block, Paul says. The gospel is a stumbling block to the Jews. The word stumbling block means a trap or a snare. It's anything that provides a hindrance or something that prevents someone from making progress. They see the gospel, like in this case, the new covenant. They're, they're hooked with the old covenant and... Jesus comes along and offers them a new covenant and they don't want it because it's different from the old covenant. So the gospel's a stumbling block. It causes them some spiritual difficulties. The book of Hebrews explains the connection between the old covenant and the new covenant. Um, so they, they react to the gospel by seeing it as a hindrance, a stumbling block. But what is the reality of the gospel in reference to the Jews wanting a sign? It is the power of God unto salvation. Okay. Can and, I uh, just add to that? <clears throat> you know, sometimes we think of stumbling block as something that just happens to be in your way. Um, but the book of Peter identifies Jesus Christ as both the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. In other words, that, that was intended rock for unbelievers to stumble on, and also the same, a rock of offense for those who disbelieve. Uh, so Jesus Christ is that stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. And so this is not just an incidental stumbling block. This is a stumbling block placed in their way by God for those who continue to, not, to, to deny that they would stumble and be offended by it, they'd be struck by it. That's really the kind of idea of, of, of that. So it's not just an incidental rock, but it's one that's placed there by God deliberately as both judgment for those who don't believe, but also salvation for those who do. Right, and we'll see that idea kind of worked out as we go along here. Uh, there's a dividing line. Okay. And that's the dividing line. And what's the nature of the gospel then? Uh, it's stronger than men. The Jews want a sign, but the gospel is stronger than anything they could come up with. And we'll leave that last column blank for the moment and go back to the Greeks. What do the Greeks look for? They look for wisdom. How do they react to the gospel? They think it's foolishness. It's, who could ever think that salvation could come through just faith? Uh, Paul had that experience, this attitude in Athens, Acts chapter 17. He's presenting this new God the unknown God, to the Athenians. And they're all listening and paying attention and going along with what he's saying until he talks about resurrection. And then they said, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> like someone's going to come back to life. <laughs> that ain't going to happen. So the gospel's foolishness. What's the reality of the gospel in reference to that? It's the wisdom of God. If the Greeks want wisdom, where else are you going to get it? Or what? better sourced can you have and the nature of the gospel it's wiser than men so we get to that last column the Jews want a sign and what does that relate to it relates to power or authority basically deity in this case uh, here in Mark the Jews are asking for a sign from heaven you know give us some authority that you have for doing what you're doing. And from now on, they're always asking that. What authority you have. And for the Greeks, they want wisdom. What does that relate to? That relates to what makes sense from a human point of view. So they're dealing with humanity there. They have kind of a limited focus. The Jews at least are thinking in the right direction. <laughs> We want some authenticity from God that what you're doing is, is accurate, is real, is authoritative. 
the Greeks were looking at things from a purely human point of view. So what makes sense to, to people? I remember one time years ago at work, I was talking to a Mormon lady. She worked there in our office. And we got to discussing the nature of salvation. Of course, Mormons, you know, in Mormonism, you have to work for your salvation. God's death on the cross provided you with resurrection from the dead, but that's all. What you, any benefits you gain after that, it depends on what you do. It depends on your works. You have to earn it. And I was telling you what well, the Bible says that salvation is a gift. You know, God offers it. All you can do is accept it. And she looked at me and said, but is that fair? <laughs> because we're so used to the idea that you, you earn the benefits. You have to work for it you know, to get the benefits. And I told her, I says, well, who decides what's fair? You know, if God said this is the way it is, then that's the way it is, whether we think it's fair or not. And technically, it's not fair. <laughs> that's the whole point. You know, it's God's grace. So the Greeks are after uh, thing, are looking at things from a human point of view. The Jews, at least, are looking at things from a divine point of view, but they're not willing to accept the evidence when it comes. That's the problem. And uh, the writer to the book of Hebrews addresses this, talking to the Hebrews, the Jewish congregation he's writing to, some of whom wanted to go back to the old covenant after they had accepted the new covenant. He says, don't do that, because then you get yourself in real trouble, because the old covenant doesn't work anymore. It's been replaced by the new covenant. If you go back, all you can face is judgment. You've got no benefits. And he says, they're laying aside the sin that so easily besets us. And you've probably heard that verse applied to, you know, we all have weaknesses. And, you know, and it has nothing to do with that. <laughs> He's talking about Jews. The sin that besets the Jews is unbelief throughout the whole Old Testament. They were always going after foreign gods, you know, the idols. So the sin which besets the Israelites was unbelief and that we see that working out here they have the evidence slapped right in their face and we'll go through that in a minute and yet they still refuse to accept it okay, so they got the right perspective but they stop short of, of believing it so back to our main train of thought here the Pharisees ask for the sign we, in verses 11 to 13 we we uh, read through those. Notice it's, first of all, they have kind of an ulterior motive here for asking for a sign. It says in verse 11, they asked him this to test him, to put him to the test. Like, can you prove it? You know, where's your proof that you have the authority to do this? And they, of course, expected him to fail the test. We see this throughout the Gospels, that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes are always coming to him with trick questions, trying to trip him up. You know, they're not honest questions. Same thing here. Prove it. And they expect him, of course, to fail the test. And we have his denial, verse 12, sighing deeply. This is the same word we saw back in chapter 7, verse 34, when he... Uh, healed the deaf and dumb man, it says uh, in verse 34, chapter 7, looking up into heaven with a deep sigh. Same word here in, in verse 12, but it's an intensified form. This is a really deep sigh, like, <sighs> just not again. <laughs> Why, he says, does this generation seek for a sign? As we mentioned a minute ago, how many signs do you need? They saw all the healings that went on recently just north of there in Gennesaret. They were aware of all of that. And all those healings, you know, they wouldn't accept it as legitimate. I don't know why. We have the same thing in earlier chapters, I think it's chapter 6, when he went back to his hometown, Nazareth. 
you know, they wouldn't believe that he was God. They knew he had all these powers to heal and cast out demons. They couldn't explain it, but they wouldn't accept the idea that he has those powers because he's God. What do you, the evidence is there. <laughs> if you don't want to accept it, you know, what's left? So I'm sure he's really frustrated here. He says, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. Uh, I want to talk about this word generation. It causes a lot of confusion. Um, and I think probably the confusion stems from the idea of the fact that people try to define biblical terms with modern definitions. You can't do that. You have to define the term based on how it's used. Every word has two definitions. The, the denotative definition, that's the dictionary definition, and the connotative definition, the, what it means in context. And since this is 2,000 years ago, in order to know what these words meant, we have to go back to a 2,000-year-old context, the text itself and the culture. We tend to use the word generation to mean, well, several things, I guess. The people who are around us now. Some people have said a generation is 40 years. Well, who says? And back in the 60s, some of you may remember that, late 60s, there was what was called the generation gap. <laughs> because values in America were changing. You know, the 1960s started America was still stable and solid because it had a, a value focus. And the, as this decade continued, people started to fragment. And we have what was called the counterculture revolution that young people were saying, well, we don't like those values. We want our own values. And so they called this a generation gap because the parents held to a certain set of values, but their children were going after different values. So there is a separation between those generations. So the generation was defined as parents, and the next generation was the children. That's one way we use the term. Uh, we also use it in a way I, that I think works here, and we'll see it in the context. From technology, what do they call it when they come out with a new update to any kind of software. The next generation of this software. Okay. So in that case, it's talking about a kind or a category. And I think that fits in, in this biblical uh, use of the term generation. People are confused because, for example, in Matthew 24 and 25, when Jesus is talking about what the end times are gonna be like for the Jews, he says, um, this generation will not pass away before all of these things are fulfilled. And people take that phrase, this generation, to mean the people he's talking to right there. And they say, but those things haven't happened yet, and that generation is long gone, so you have a problem in the Bible. No, they just didn't understand the way he's using generation. <laughs> When he said this generation, he meant the generation that is alive at the time those things go on. That generation of people will not pass away until all those things are fulfilled. <clears throat> same thing, same idea here, I think. This generation, this kind of people is what it's talking about. The unbelievers. If I can put it in technology terms, you could say that unbelieving Israel, the people who rejected, the, rejected Jesus when he came along, you remember back in the early parts, early chapters, John the Baptist was out preaching repentance and people were coming out and repenting and being baptized. And the, of course, not everybody was. Some people stayed home. Okay. <clears throat> so you might consider the Israelites who did not 
repent. The Israelites who, who did not accept Jesus as the Messiah, you could call that Israel 1.9, generation 1.9, and the Jews who believed the new covenant and accepted Jesus as the Messiah would be Israel 2.0, the next generation. I think that's what he means here in verse 12, Mark chapter 8, verse 12. Um, I say to you, this, this, no sign will be given to this generation, the unbelieving Israelites, this kind of people. Why? Because they wouldn't believe it anyway. <clears throat> so this is, I, th I think this is figurative of people, really of any time period, uh, who are characterized by unbelief this generation of people, this kind of people, characterized by unbelief. Why will he not give them a sign? Well, first of all, they had already rejected multiple signs. They had plenty of opportunity from the beginning of the book. <laughs> they had time after time, all the healings, casting out of demons, they saw those things. And they rejected them half the time. So I have a list here. First of all, there was the healing of the paralytic in chapter 2. They let the paralytic down through the roof, you remember. And Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees and the group said, wait a minute. Only God can forgive sins. Who does he think he is? And so he said, well, okay, what's easier, to forgive sins or to heal? You know, only God can do either of those. And so he heals the man proving that he had the authority to forgive sins. They didn't accept it. They rejected it. Chapter 3, the first six verses, we have healing the man with a withered hand in the synagogue on the Sabbath. So the guy comes to Jesus. He's had a stroke or something like that. He can't use his hand. And uh, the Pharisees are sitting there watching him. What is, is he going to do anything on the Sabbath? You know, there are, again, superficial ideas about Sabbath healing. Sabbath violations. And he healed him, and they immediately went out and plotted how to kill him. I mean, it's a miracle. <laughs> and instead of bowing down and worshiping, they want to get rid of this guy. He's upsetting the apple cart. Also, there were casting out of demons, chapter 3, verse 22. Um, we don't have the whole incident there, but we just have the reaction of the Pharisees saying that he casts out demons by the power of Satan. Of course, he goes on to explain that, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Why, why would Satan fight himself? But they attributed his ability to cast out demons to demonic power rejecting the divine source of that power. And finally, there were healing of a variety of illnesses. Again, at the end of chapter 6, verses 53 to 56, he went to Gennesaret and went all through the towns and the cities and out in the open and healed all kinds of people, and the Pharisees were there. And in chapter 1, again, we see, or chapter 7, verse 1, they kind of corral him and say, what about these little ceremonies? He just healed all these people. <laughs> and they're worried about how the disciples wash their hands. Completely missed the point. So why on earth would he give them another sign? Okay. There's no point. No point in giving verification to those who are committed to rejecting it. We could go back, we won't take time to turn there, but in chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, he's, he's just started to, to teach in parables, and the disciples asked him, why are you doing this? He said, to hide the truth from those who won't accept it. So why give them the truth? Why clarify the truth to them when they're not going to accept it anyway? And in chapter 11, verses 27 to 33, he's in Jerusalem, and the the high priests and the scribes and Pharisees approach him saying, you know, what authority do you have to teach these things? 
and he knows they don't, they don't care. <laughs> They're just trying to find something to accuse him of. And so he said, well, I'll ask you a question first, and you answer my question, and I'll answer yours. And Was John the Baptist teaching from God or from men? So they reason, they get together in a little huddle there, you know. If we say it's from, <clears throat> excuse me, if we say it's from God, he's going to say, then why didn't you believe it? But if we say it's from men, then we're going to have a riot because the people think John was a prophet. So they said, well, we don't know. And he said, well, I'm not going to answer your question either. <laughs> because they don't care. They didn't want an answer. He, by then, you know, they, they had already made their choice. Their fate had already been sealed. So why bother giving them evidence? And after chapter 8, verse 11, when they're asking him for a sign, they no longer ask for signs, but they try to trap him, trick him in his words, and they plot to kill him. So they're through with the guise of saying, all we need is proof. They're saying, forget it, you know, we don't care. He knew that, he knew they didn't care. And so now they're just, just flat out, out to get him any way they can. So they never ask for a sign again. And we'll see that as we go through the rest of the book. <clears throat> so verse 13 then, it says, And leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. So he's here in, uh, from, went from Decapolis up to Magdala. And the disciples, on the way across the sea over to Bethsaida, uh, the disciples learn a lesson about God's sufficiency and Jesus' deity. Set in contrast to the Pharisaical teachings, we already saw that in, when Jesus straightened the Pharisees out about the superficiality of their, their little ceremonies. Uh, so he gives the disciples another lesson. And it's kind of frustrating. Well, I think he's frustrated because they're still not getting it. So he goes over from there to Bethsaida. It says in verse uh, 13 that he went to the other side. But if you go over to verse 22, at the end of that journey, it says they came to Bethsaida. So this is the Bethsaida on the east side, Gentile territory. And interesting, verse 14, well, we'll get there. Um, so verses 14 to 21, we have this trip across the water, and he's teaching the disciples on this trip, on this voyage. Verse 14 says, and they had forgotten to take bread and did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. They were never Boy Scouts. The Boy Scout motto is, be prepared. <laughs> they weren't prepared. Well, they, they, as we discussed before, they kind of left in a hurry. He goes over there and he talks to the Pharisees and they reject him, or they ask for a sign and he says, no, you guys wouldn't accept it even if I gave you one. And he turns around and leaves. So maybe they didn't have time to go to the store to get some bread. But they had only one loaf. So it bothers them. This shows the focus of the disciples, and this comes into play in, in this, this uh, scenario here as they're crossing the water. They have a very earth-centered focus. They're worried about bread. They had just seen Jesus feed the 4,000. <laughs> They had just seen him heal people. And if they're worried about having too little bread. I mean, think about it. If he can feed 4,000 people with just a few crumbs, you know, what can he do with that loaf and 12 guys? <laughs> it's not a problem. Okay. Notice verse 15. And he was giving orders to them saying, watch out. Basically, that's literally what it means. 
it comes to the word to see. You know, watch out. Be ready. Be prepared. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. He probably mentions Herod here because you see on the map there, they were in Magdala. Just south of there is Tiberias. That's where Herod had his headquarters. He was in charge of Galilee and also an area south and east of the, of the uh, Sea of Galilee, Perea. And so his headquarters were kind of centrally located there in Tiberias. Tiberias, of course, was named after the Caesar. Tiberius Caesar. So he's in that area. So he's probably, that probably reminds him of Herod. And the leaven is the unbelief of the Pharisees. And he throws Herod in there because Herod wanted to kill him as well. And Luke tell, talks about that, I think, in chapter 13. Some people are telling Jesus, you better get out of here because Herod wants to kill you. <laughs> so he's right along there with the Pharisees being antagonistic. And Matthew adds the Sadducees in there as well. So beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And the leaven of Herod. And what did the, how did the disciples interpret that? Verse 16. And they began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. Well, leaven is yeast. And of course, you need yeast to make bread. So they're thinking, oh, he's mad at us because we didn't bring enough bread. What's Jesus' response? Verse 17. He knew what they were talking about. So he said to them, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? So we have here, the first, the disciples' limited focus. They miss the analogy in verses 14 to 16. They're thinking about physical bread, and he's thinking about spiritual issues and using leaven as an example of a spiritual issue. Now I have to go back and define terms again. The word leaven, of course, means yeast. And sometimes in the Bible, it's used as a, as a symbol of sin. In um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, is it? When you have the man living, married to his uh, stepmother. Not a kosher relationship. And the Corinthians are proud of it, you know. Because of God's grace, we're allowing this to happen. You know, isn't this great? We're depending on God's grace. And Paul says, no, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> sin is sin. So he tells them, clean out that leaven. So sometimes leaven is used as a symbol for sin, but not always. In Matthew 12, with the parables of the kingdom, he uses leaven as an example of the growth of the kingdom. Because leaven, you know, how much yeast does it take to make a whole lump of dough rise? Not very much. It starts out small and ends up big. And in reference to the kingdom, it started out with just Israel and then ended up including the Gentiles as well. So it expands. So leaven in that case is not a symbol of sin. It's a symbol of growth. But leaven in itself is, is I guess you could say, a pervasive influence. Wherever it gets, it expands. That can be good and that can be bad. In this case, it's bad. The leaven of the Pharisees is their distorted view of what's required. Again, back to the first 23 verses of chapter 7, where he talks about the shallowness of their, their requirements. So the, the leaven of the Pharisees is their false teaching. And he, he, he condemns the, the disciples there in verse 17 for not realizing that. Do you not yet see or understand? And that word understand is the same word we've seen before. It, it's a compound word that means to put together, like putting two and two together to come to a conclusion. How many times had they seen him deal with <laughs> Pharisees, uh, healing people, feeding all these people, uh, and they, they, they still don't get the point of who he is? Do you yeah, have especially, sorry, especially after feeding four thousand and then feeding five thousand, 
they should have realized that he's not talking about physical leaven because he can produce food anytime he wants. Right. It uh, reminds me a little bit of the Israelites when they went to the promised land. They're afraid of the Canaanites when they were just delivered out of Egypt and Pharaoh and, and Pharaoh's army. Uh, but I, I think the lesson that you're giving on leaven also is a reminder to us never to assume that a certain word is always bad or always good. You always have to look at the context. And another example of that would be the word lion. Lion can be used to refer to Jesus Christ as the lion of Judah, but Peter also refers to Satan as a prowling, as a lion who's, uh, as, as one who's looking for someone to devour. Right. Context is everything. So the leaven of the Pharisees, don't you get it yet? This is not physical leaven. So Jesus starts to clarify this then, verses 17 through uh, 21. Verse, we read 17, verse 18. Notice what a slap in the face to the disciples. He quotes what he said before in chapter 4. The reason he spoke in parables was the same thing here. This, to keep the truth away from the people who have eyes, but they can't see, and ears, but they can't hear, meaning they have rejected it. So he's saying, are you the same? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? I mean, he's saying, do you have the same problem that the Pharisees have? So the emphasis here is on their lack of spiritual understanding. They're just like the outsiders. Do you also lack eyes to see and ears to hear? That's a wake-up call. And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets of broken pieces you picked up? And they said 12. <laughs> and Verse 20, and when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said seven. So they knew, they had the facts, but they didn't make the connection. They're still thinking in earthly terms. They're not thinking in spiritual terms. Notice it says they're large baskets. The word large isn't in the Greek. It comes from the word basket. We talked about this last week. These baskets were huge baskets. Different from the baskets for the feeding of the 5,000, which were smaller, maybe like bushel baskets. And I mentioned last week that these seven baskets full might have held more than the 12 baskets full because they were so much larger. But I got to thinking, maybe it came out even. <laughs> Maybe seven large baskets equals 12 small baskets. That's a, another possibility. So at verse 21, he summarizes this. And he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? I mean, how long is it going to take you to get the point? Are you exercising the same unbelief that the Pharisees exercise? Now, when are you going to wake up? Now, Matthew does us a favor. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 16 just to, to uh, expand the, the conclusion here because in Mark chapter 8 verse 21 uh, it just kind of leaves at that question. Do you not yet understand? And we don't know if the disciples got the point or not. <laughs> And understand what? So Matthew does us a favor. Matthew chapter 16, verses 11 and 12. says, How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? But beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And verse 12, they get it. Then they understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So don't follow their example. 
Now, technically, they should have gotten that because, again, in chapter 7, the first 23 verses, he really lays it out there that the Pharisees' teachings were false teachings. They were shallow. They, they weren't the substance, the reality. And the disciples should have picked up on that. But they finally get it at this point. <clears throat> so we have that application then. I'm sorry, we have the clear evidence that they should have paid attention to, verses 19 and 20, those miraculous feedings. And then we have the application in verse 21 and, and filling it out with Matthew chapter 16, verses 11 and 12. So the teaching of the Pharisees, we see that again in chapter 2, verses 23 to 28 in chapter 7, 1 to 23, is superficial rules relating, related to their unbelief. The Pharisees didn't want to believe the signs because they were comfortable in their own little system there, even though their system was not consistent with what God wanted from the Old Covenant. So the Pharisees, or the disciples need to be careful that they don't fall into that same pharisaical frame of mind. They need to focus on the reality of things, not the superficiality of it. So to wrap this up, the, the disciples had all the evidence they needed to realize who he was and to trust him, but were displaying the same spiritual dullness and unbelief of the Jewish leaders. When he says back there in, at the end of verse 17, do you have a hardened heart? The same word he used back in chapter 3, I think. He's about to heal the man with a withered hand and the disciple, or excuse me, the Pharisees are looking at him carefully to see if he's going to violate the Sabbath by healing this guy. And it says that he was angry with them because of their hardness of heart. They weren't, they didn't care about this guy. <laughs> he's about to deliver this guy from a lifetime limitation and they don't care they're insensitive their heart was hardened and the word hardened there means to be covered with a callus you know if you have cal you know those of you who play guitar <laughs> you know what it's like to have calluses on your fingertips and you know that you don't feel things very well <laughs> through those calluses that's the word here hardened heart your heart has become calloused you're insensitive to spiritual things. And the, <clears throat> the healing is supposed to point to who Christ is. So the fact that they're waiting to see if he is going to heal on the Sabbath tells you they're waiting for the sign that's supposed to reveal to them who he is, but they're waiting to see if he does it on the Sabbath so that they can blame him. Right. Yeah. So again, the evidence doesn't matter to them. <laughs> you know, they want to protect their own uh, system. They don't need anybody getting in their way. All right, well, we're just about out of time, and this brings us to the end of um, this section of the book of Mark. Chapter 8, verse 22 begins the next big section. There are three sections in the book. Now, as I said, I think I mentioned this last week, the outline that I gave you at the beginning when we started this, not my outline, but my outline wouldn't fit. <laughs> We'd be here forever. So I did some searching and I found an outline that I thought would be useful. But I think it's a little off because that outline has him starting his journey south to Judah in verse 22 of chapter 8. But technically, he doesn't move to Judah until chapter 10, verse 1. And so I think this outline is a little off. That The person who put that outline together sees uh, chapter 8, verse 22 through chapter 10, or to chapter 10, verse 1, as preparation for his move south. And uh, we'll see how that goes. That, I think that fits. But uh, I don't think this is really the place where the book divides. Okay. But we'll see that when we get there. So next time we will review his ministry in Galilee, which was 
chapter 1 up through chapter 8, verse 21, according to this outline. We will review that and then get into the next section, starting in verse 22 of chapter 8. So, any observations, comments, confusions or contusions? All right, let's close in prayer. Our Father, again, we thank you for providing more than enough evidence for anyone to recognize the truth and submit to the truth. We pray that you will enable us to do that as we trust you through our daily lives and as we present the truth to others. In Jesus' name, amen.